Hi, my name is Josh Weikert. Uh, I'm the author of the Beer Simple blog, and I've been brewing for about 10 years now. And we're here today to talk about low alcohol brewing, uh, session brewing, uh, for lack of a better term. Though, as we'll see, session beer is kind of a misnomer. Uh, low alcohol brewing in general has some tips and techniques that you'd want to apply, whether you're shooting for a beer that you can drink in large quantities or just a beer that is lower in alcohol but doesn't seem like it's light beer. There are a lot of good reasons to engage in low alcohol brewing. First of all, uh, as you're drinking your own product, you can drink more of it. You do more easily regulate the effects of the alcohol because there's just less coursing through your veins. But there are some practical reasons to want to do it as well. The most significant of which is that it is cheaper to brew low alcohol beer. In addition to using less malt and less hops, you're also using a smaller yeast pitch. So across the board, you're getting uh, more value, more beer for fewer ingredients. And even if you wanted to use the same amount of ingredients, uh, which as we'll talk about, there might be reasons to do that, you can then dilute the beer and actually stretch it a bit. So you can, instead of brewing a 3.5% beer, you can brew a 7% beer and just dilute it 50% with water. And now you end up with twice the volume of a lower alcohol beer. Another reason you would want to try low alcohol brewing is that alcohol is a, a necessary byproduct of brewing. We want it, but at the same time, it's something that makes brewing harder. Uh, yeast, who, who are doing the real heavy lifting there when it comes to brewing, don't like alcohol in their environment, even as they're producing it. It's a waste product, and the higher the alcohol, the more toxic that environment is. And as a result, you're, you're running a greater risk of off flavors. You're running a greater risk of getting hot alcohols, fusel alcohols that are going to taste unpleasant on the palate. Um, and at the same time, you're also increasing the risk of yeast mutation and autolysis and everything else. So as alcohol increases, degree of difficulty of brewing increases. So by definition, then if we're brewing a low alcohol beer, we're taking it a little easier on ourselves and on the yeast. So what do we mean when we talk about session beer? Uh, session beer doesn't have a fixed definition, but there are some common norms that we tend to apply to it. Session beer is usually 4.5% uh, ABV or lower. Um, some people will tell you it's 4.2%, others will say anything under 5%, but something in the 4 to 5% range is generally considered a lower alcohol beer. The distinction, though, is that we're making a light beer, L-I-G-H-T, light beer, a lighter version of a beer. We're not making light beer, L-I-T-E, light beer. The goal is not necessarily to produce something that you can, that you can chug and pound down. That's not really why we're doing it. We're doing it to, uh, to as, we, as I said earlier, take advantage of the lower alcohol environment for the yeast. We're doing it so we can you know, share more of it around. Uh, we're not doing it necessarily to make a beer that's easier to drink. So that's what session beer is. Session beers are usually conceived as beers that are being easier to drink, but that doesn't mean you have to brew a session beer, a beer with lower alcohol, that is perceivable as being a lower alcohol beer. There are some tricks that you can use to get something that seems much fuller and seems like it's an actually like a much bigger beer, even something like a Russian Imperial Stout, but that only has 4.5% in alcohol. It's harder to do, but it can be done, and you can sort of trick the palate into perceiving these things, even if there's actually lower alcohol levels in general. If you're going to brew low alcohol beer, there are some important recipe considerations uh, to bear in mind when you're building out your recipe that are unique to bring lower alcohol beers. Uh, the first and big red flag is no matter what you're brewing, and there are lots of recipes that call for this uh, in their full strength varieties that you would never do in a low alcohol version, you should be adding no simple sugars whatsoever uh, directly to the beer. No, no table sugar, no honey, uh, no maple syrup, nothing like that. because. Although they can introduce flavors we might want, generally speaking, those are added in those recipes to thin out a beer. Uh, they, even if they add some flavor, it's not worth it to us because the challenge we're gonna face is building up enough body in the beer in that low alcohol environment. So no simple sugars at all. If it, if it ferments off 100%, we don't want it, okay? In terms of the grist itself, we have to reconsider the way we approach normal recipe building because we all sort of walk around as brewers with this idea in our heads of what percentage fermentable sugars we want in a beer versus unfermentable sugars. And we are going to generally deliberately skew those ratios when we're brewing a low alcohol beer so that we can build up a bigger sense of body even in the presence of less actual grist. We are gonna be comfortable brewing a beer a low alcohol beer with as much as uh, 25 or 30 or even 35 or 40 percent unfermentable sugars. In other words, sugars derived from crystal malts or roast malts. Now that number would be absurd in a larger beer because it would make it far too heavy. It might make it seem very sweet, but that's kind of exactly what we want out of a session beer if we're trying to mimic a larger style. And even if we're not trying to scale down a recipe from, from its standard strength down to a session strength, even if it's just a straight session beer like we're brewing today, um, we still want to take care that we don't end up with something that just takes like, tastes like carbonated you know, hop water. 
So we want to bulk up the beer a little bit. The way to approach this, I find, is that if we use as an inspiration a standard recipe, is to take your specialty grains, your crystal malts, your toasted malts, your roasted malts, and reduce them by about 25% from that standard recipe. And then what you're gonna do is essentially backfill with base grains uh, up to whatever gravity you're shooting for. So rather than just taking your recipe and scaling it down by 30% to get it from 9% or 6% to 4%, what you're gonna do instead is make that three to one, or excuse me, three fourths adjustment to the specialty grains and then build up with base grains to the, to the starting gravity we're looking for, in this case about 1042. In terms of base grains, that's something else to think about. Which base grains do we use? For lots of styles, it's perfectly acceptable and even desirable to use a traditional standard two-row American malt that doesn't add a ton of flavor. Since we're gonna be brewing a low alcohol beer, we wanna get as much flavor as we can out of every ingredient that we can. And so it makes a lot more sense to choose something like Maris Otter or Pilsner uh, or even Munich or Vienna that are going to add character in addition to adding gravity points that we're gonna ferment off later. In addition to thinking about how much of each specialty grain we're gonna put in, we also wanna think about how many we're going to use. Uh, the advantage of using more specialty grains in a, a traditional recipe is that you're giving yourself a greater potential for complexity and you're giving yourself more flavor options that you get to add in. In a lower alcohol beer though, since we have a proportionally smaller grist and we have less room to play with in terms of gravity points, you want to limit the number of specialty grains you're using in terms of the number of types. Um, if we have, you know, if we think of sort of the 100% volume of specialty grains we're using, if we use five different specialty grains, then we only get sort of one-fifth of that specialty grist per grain. That might only end up being two or three ounces. But if we can get away with just two or three of those specialty grains, if you pick the most significantly flavorful of them, then you get to add more of them, and it increases in, more by weight of them. And as a result, it means that we stand a greater chance of getting the flavor that we're going for and using that to begin with. So in today's recipe, uh, I would ordinarily use some, you know, some victory malt, some biscuit malt, uh, a crystal 45, a crystal 120, and then maybe a little bit of special B on the higher end to make sure we get sort of a richer flavor. Here, instead, I chop that all back to just biscuit malt and just special B because I get to use more of them as a result. And so I guarantee that I'm getting those hallmark flavors. We can also think about using things like oats or, uh, or flaked barley or flaked maize, things that add multiple elements. And in that case, we're getting mouthfeel as well as flavor. So try to get as much out of your grist as you can. When we think about uh, process considerations and brewing considerations for low alcohol beers, we kind of have to start thinking about the mash. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and start uh, Vorloffing here. And we'll get a nice clear run of word out of the mash ton. The purpose of mashing is to convert starches into sugars, obviously. When we're mashing a low alcohol beer, we have less grain in the grist. And what that can mean is that we have some, flex, some fluctuation in, in efficient mash efficiency that we might have to contend with. If you have a smaller mash ton that you can work with, I use my standard size mash ton all the time, and as a result, I lose some efficiency points. If you have a smaller mash ton for your lower alcohol batches, you can get better drainage through the grist uh, if you go ahead and use that. Uh, but you don't have to. You can simply adjust the recipe and increase your grist, and the result will be a beer that by calculation will be a little higher than you might anticipate, but in practical terms, when we're done draining off, you'll find that the gravity will tend to hit, and I find it's about a 10% adjustment uh, in the mash uh, to the grist. You might also wanna think about the length of time that you're mashing. Um, we want generally a less fermentable wort, which is kind of a weird situation. Normally we're trying to maximize our fermentability. Here we're doing the opposite, so you might wanna shorten up your mash time, maybe to about 40 or 45 minutes. You're still gonna get most of your conversion, that alpha amylase and beta amylase activity really only takes about 35 to 40 minutes. It might increase some of the residual starch that we get out of the mash, and that might add some body when we do finally ferment it off. Now, something else we have to think about in terms of mash and lower alcohol beers is temperature. And this one really is key. Uh, this is really not optional. You're almost always, when it comes to mashing in in lower alcohol beers, you're going to, going to want to mash in at a higher temperature. Normally, we would be mashing in at around 152, 153, maybe a little lower if you want a slightly more fermentable wort. Um, here we want to produce a lot more long chain sugars. We want more beta amylase activity. And so we're gonna mash in at a higher temperature. 
Um, you'll see some people say as high as 158, 159 Fahrenheit, which is, you know, I think, a little bit on the high end. Uh, for lower alcohol beers, I tend to mash in at about 156 or 157 Fahrenheit. And what that's going to do is it's going to produce more long chain to simple sugars in terms of the ratio. At 152, we're getting about you know, 4 to 1 simple sugars to more complex sugars that the yeast will struggle to ferment. Uh, but we give them plenty of simple sugars to ferment, ferment off as well. And again, in our recipe, if we're talking about a high alcohol beer where we need to bring the body down, we can add simple sugars directly to the fermenter, right? And that way we guarantee they have that big dose of honey or cane sugar or whatever it is. Here we want the opposite though. We want a beer that has more residual sugars because that will add body. It will also generally not add sweetness. So we're getting a little bonus there in that we're bulking up the beer and we're making it seem bigger but we're not paying a price in terms of additional sweetness that we need down to counterbalance with other things like bitterness or roast. So those are some things to think about in terms of the mash. Okay, just like we have considerations in the recipe and the grist and the grains, we also have some considerations in terms of hopping. The most significant thing we have to keep in mind is that most of the time hops in terms of bitterness are being used to counterbalance sweetness from alcohol. Um, and in most recipes we can point at the IBU to gravity unit ratio as a useful guide in terms of how bitter a beer should be. So if we're taking a beer that's with a starting gravity of 1070, so it's a relatively strong IPA, we might balance that roughly one to one in terms of gravity points to IBUs, and so we'd be looking for 50 to 70 IBUs. Since we're dropping gravity down, we also need to make an adjustment to how much we add in terms of bitterness, because otherwise if we stick to those same bitterness calculations, the beer is going to be excessively bitter. And it's much more important when it comes to bittering than it does to flavor and aroma. The flavor and aroma hop additions, you can almost leave exactly as they are, but for bittering, you're going to need to chop back your IBUs to match whatever the existing ratio was. So for this beer, I normally bitter it at about 0.8 IBUs per gravity point, so it's usually clocking in at about 50 or 55 IBUs. Here, since we only have 42 gravity points, we're going to come in at closer to 30, 35 IBUs. So as a result, we end up with relatively small additions uh, at bittering and disproportionately larger additions in flavor and aroma if we're going to use those kinds of hops, which we are. So instead of measuring out a, you know, a, a solid you know, three quarters of an ounce to an ounce, uh, we're just going with about a half an ounce here, and that should get it done for us uh, for a bittering addition. When it comes to later hopping, flavored aroma hopping, you can generally keep the same amount of hops you would ordinarily use because there we're less concerned about the isomerization of alpha acids. They might be adding one or two additional IBUs that we you know, would ordinarily not get in a denser wort, but it's probably not that big a deal. Where I do want to give you one note of caution though is in dry hopping. In heavier beers, a full strength IPA for example, or uh, an American barley wine that you're chopping down to size, or a Russian IPA that you might be adding late hops to, um, dry hopping is okay in those beers because you have a lot of flavor competing with it. In session strength beers of the same type though, there might not be enough malt backbone and enough flavor to adequately offset the grassy or resiny flavors that you're going to get from dry hopping and it might actually end up muting uh, some of the actual hop aromas that we do want. Um, so it might be a good idea to avoid dry hopping when it comes to session beers, even session IPAs. I tend to just increase the, the late boil hops rather than using a dry hop, just to make sure I'm not going to end up with a beer that tastes like, like, like plant matter. Finally, the last part of our recipe consideration would be yeast. Um, yeast strain selection is important for all kinds of reasons, as we all know. Uh, every yeast ferments a different, uh, with different flavors. Every yeast will ferment to a different degree of attenuation. Uh, different yeasts have a tendency to perform better in higher alcohol environments. That's not a concern for us here because we're brewing at lower alcohol levels. So we can sort of leave the alcohol tolerance uh, completely off the table. The other two though we do really want to pay attention to. You're going to want to choose a yeast strain that is less attenuative than your traditional yeast strain for whatever that style is. Uh, there are lager strains and English strains that just have a, 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 a reputation for fermenting off less fully. We actually want that in this kind of beer, so we want to go ahead and target those. Um, rather than using your traditional strain, which might ferment off uh, to a higher degree, because that's typically our goal, here we actually want to leave some things behind. When we're choosing a yeast, we might choose a yeast that's more flavorful, something more like French Cezanne rather than Belgian Ardennes because it produces a lot more fermentation character, character. or we might choose like a Nottingham yeast, which has a more obvious and pronounced fruitiness to it rather than one of the London Ale yeasts. And we do that because it helps ensure that we get something of the yeast character that we're hoping for. 
We also need to keep in mind that it's gonna ferment off a lot faster. Fermentation happens quicker when there's just less sugar available to ferment. And as a result, uh, the, the fermentation process itself can actually be speeded along quite a bit. Uh, because primary fermentation, in terms of the simple sugars in the work, can be done in as little as 24 to 48 hours. Uh, whereas in other beers, it might take four or five days. Finally, uh, from a recipe perspective, we can talk about water additions. Now, these are very idiosyncratic. Your own water profile may not require any adjustment at all. Uh, but for those who do get into adjusting their water, um, this is for you. Uh, since we're talking about a beer where we're trying to increase the impression of malt character, since we have just literally less grain in the mash, we might want to adjust our water in a way that emphasizes malt flavors. And we do that by adding chloride relative to sulfate. Um, in a beer like this one, uh, the uh, small version of an English IPA I'm brewing today, I would ordinarily add some, some gypsum to my, uh, to my mash to increase the flinty flavor of the bitterness. Since we have less malt and less sugar behind that anyway, I'm not doing that. And if I were talking about a beer where I really wanted to increase the maltiness, like when I do the, uh, uh, the cut version of my Russian Imperial Stout, I actually go the other way and actually add uh, some, some chloride to the mash because that way I get those rounded malt flavors, even in the presence of less actual malt. And one last thing, and that is that if you have any flavor contributions from your water, since we have a lower flavor threshold for lots of our additions in the first place, if you have water that tastes a certain way, that's more likely to come out in a lower alcohol beer. So it's just something to bear in mind. After we're done boiling and we're done chilling, uh, we move to fermentation. Now it's at, that, at this point where we're about to pitch yeast that we might go ahead and aerate the word or actually add a direct infusion of oxygen. I'm gonna caution you not to do that with most of your session beers. Uh, that's principally a tool to uh, speed up the process of fermentation and attenuation uh, to limit the probability that something we don't want growing in the wort takes over from the yeast. Since we're talking about such a small gravity to begin with, um, it's less likely that that's going to happen because the yeast are gonna churn through the available sugars so quickly. And not only that, but if you make life too easy on the yeast, they tend to not produce the fermentation characteristics we want. So I'm not gonna tell you to stress out your yeast on purpose, but maybe don't go out of your way to help them too much either. Uh, leave them to start up in their, in their own good time. Don't, don't aggressively shake or aerate your wort. Don't use the oxygen directly. Um, and in terms of fermentation temperature, maybe, uh, maybe sort of throttle it down by a couple of degrees initially and then push it at the very end to make sure that you don't ferment off too quickly and also to ensure that you produce some kind of the fermentation character we want at those higher temperatures. And if you do that, you're probably gonna be getting a similar fermentation profile at the end of fermentation as you would for a standard strength beer. When it comes to brewing session beers, you can actually scale down almost any recipe to session strength. Uh, I don't care how high the alcohol is, uh, it, it is adjustable. I mean, you, you can mimic those flavors. Uh, I've scaled down, as I mentioned, my Russian Imperial Stout recipe, which is a, a reasonably faithful um, uh, homage to old Rasputin, and I can make that beer come out at 4.4% and still have that really rich, uh, complex Russian Imperial Stout flavor. Um, and by the same token, we can do this with Belgian strong ales. We can do it with, uh, with barley wines. I mean, there are ways to mimic it. Um, it might require a few extra ingredients, but we can definitely do it. Uh, on the one hand, we're starting with a reduction overall in the grist, as we've already covered, taking your specialty malts and cutting them by 25%, and then building to the right gravity using uh, the base malts. But we're also gonna consider adding in, if, it's, if you're trying to mimic a heavier, thicker beer, you're gonna consider adding in something like dextrin malt uh, in order to add just purely unfermentable sugars. Uh, you might consider adding lactose, uh, which is milk sugar, uh, and that will add a sweetness to the beer. So if you wanted to mimic uh, a, uh, a sweet stout, or sometimes even that Russian Imperial stout with that sort of cafe au lait flavor. You can add lactose and you can kill two birds with one stone by adding what seems like uh, the flavor of more alcohol, because ethanol does have a sweetness to it, and at the same time you're also adding a lot of body. But you're not actually increasing the fermentable gravity at all, so we're, we're kind of cheating here. Uh, we're keeping the gravity levels low. Uh, just be sure to adjust uh, the bitterness to the gravity ratios, and tie that specifically to the fermentable gravity because uh, if we're adding something like dextrin malt or lactose, we're adding gravity points in terms of how it's calculated, but it's not actually going to be fermentable, so you don't necessarily need to account for that. You're also going to want to consider, uh, in terms of scaling down your recipes, a change in yeast strain. Uh, the advantage of that is that you're going to be selecting a strain that does what you want to do in terms of attenuation and flavor, and not necessarily what you would be expecting from the yeast in a full-strength beer. You might want to consider fermenting a little hotter to produce higher alcohols if you're trying to mimic 
something like a Doppelbach or a Russian Imperial Stout. There's really no way to do that other than getting warmer alcohols. Now, I don't necessarily recommend that because it's really risky. If you get a lot of fusels and hot alcohols, you can end up with a beer that's tough to drink and tastes solventy. But I find ramping it up toward the very end uh, of fermentation, which might only be, as I said, 36 to 48 hours, that can tend to get the job done. You get a little of that warmer alcohol character out of it. Plus, don't, uh, uh, don't underestimate the power of people to just believe that they taste something that isn't there. If you hand someone a beer and say this is a Russian Imperial Stout, even if it's only 4 or 5% alcohol, they may perceive a warming in the flavor, even if it doesn't actually exist. Uh, just like we can brew beers that are 14 or, you know, 13 or 14% ABV, but don't actually seem all that hot. So it's really a question of perception. And you're trying to trick the palate of the person who's drinking the beer into thinking it's drinking something bigger and richer and fuller and higher in alcohol. And so long as we're hitting those same flavor notes, it's actually easier than you might think to reduce alcohol without reducing the impression of alcohol. Finally, in terms of some, uh, some takeaway tips, First of all, I strongly recommend reducing the ABV on everything you brew. Uh, most brewers add an extra percentage point or two of alcohol to almost everything just to bring it to that higher end of the range. Scale it back. Uh, a 7% American Strong Ale or a 9% American Barley Wine will taste just as good and just like the uh, full strength version. And in the meantime, you're saving yourself a little bit of money on ingredients and you're making your life a little bit easier. In addition, any beer, as I've said, can be scaled down. Uh, start playing around with this especially if you have, you know, if you're brewing for an event or for a party, uh, it can make life a lot easier on you because you're producing a smaller batch of beer, but you're stretching it a little further. It's also a good idea to maybe not tell people that they're drinking a session beer. Let them figure it out for themselves. Uh, it's, it's not a given that they'll even know the difference. Uh, learning how to brew beers at lower strength with a lower ABV is worth your time and attention. And not only that, but it forces you to gain a better appreciation for ingredients, how they function, what they add to the recipe, and how you can manipulate those to get a different product in the back end, which means even in your stronger beers, you have more control over what you're producing and you have a greater understanding of how your system works. All right, when it comes to the boil, uh, there's not that much different uh, compared to your standard strength beers. The biggest difference is that we need to be a lot more careful about what the exact gravity is at different points of the boils. Since we're working with a lower gravity beer, that means uh, if we're off by a few points, that's gonna have a much bigger effect on our, on our hop utilization rates for bittering. So what I'm gonna encourage you to do is go ahead and check your gravities a little more often than you ordinarily would. Uh, we obviously always check it at the start of the boil to make sure that we got relatively close to what we were shooting for. Uh, this is a good old Brix refractometer, which means I can put a hot sample directly on it. If you don't have this, you can do this with a hydrometer. You just have to make sure to lower the temperature first. Uh, but the Brix refractometer will correct for that automatically. And we drop that down and we check our gravity. And I'm actually spot on, which is lucky. <laughs> it's not always the case. If you find that you're off a little bit, what you're going to want to do is go ahead and adjust using uh, either some uh, dry or liquid malt extract, always keep a little bit on hand to increase the gravity. And for lower alcohol beers, maybe don't fill the kettle all the way to the rim. Leave yourself a little bit of room in case you have a short uh, kettle, in case you need to dilute the wort a little bit. Uh, it's easier to adjust the gravity of the wort than it is to start making adjustments on the fly with your bittering hops. Um, so you might wanna wait until you, know, you, you have the, the gravity right before you add your, add your hops into the boil. In terms of the length of the boil, you can, if you're looking to develop a richer flavor, uh, you can go ahead and engage in some kettle caramelization. In other words, run a little bit of wort off into the bottom of the kettle, boil it until it forms a syrup, and then continue running off, turn off the heat, and run off and dissolve that in. So you get that nice caramelized wort inside the wort, and you're getting it without adding any fermentable sugar. So a little bonus there. You can also lengthen your boil. And what that's going to do is concentrate the wort a little bit more, uh, it'll darken it a little bit more, and it'll add some of those Maillard flavors that we would get otherwise from things like melanoid and malt. So we have some options in the boil to sort of, again, enhance what we're getting out of it. Because remember, at every stage of the process here, since we're working with fewer ingredients and a lower gravity, it's helpful if we can get as much out of every little step that we can.